Good evening and shalom. So good to be back before you to share God's word. Uh, we do give honor to God and to our pastor, the Reverend Dr. F. James Clark, for this privilege of sharing uh, on tonight. Uh, we are going to Matthew 28, 16 through 20, as we uh, continue to talk about uh, the meaning of resurrection, which has many uh, meanings. We saw on last week, or we talked on last week about resurrection being an act of restoration. And on tonight, I want to lift another aspect of resurrection, and I pray that it will serve to be a blessing to all of you uh, who are watching. Um, if there's somebody around you um, that you think would benefit from, from this study, pull them aside um, for our time together on tonight. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 reads, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain uh, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This concludes our reading. This is the word of God. We believe it's true. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Uh, that Galilee is the place where Jesus instructed the disciples to go and meet him. Uh, it is the place of beginning for disciples. It is the place uh, where Jesus first called them. Galilee is also the place of the disciples' first instructions. It is the place where they first saw Jesus do miracles. It is a place of first. And now it is the place of new beginnings. The disciples will begin again in Galilee when they will meet the resurrected Lord and receive instructions on how to move forward with his mission. No doubt it is a long way to Galilee that they had to travel through Friday to get there. Friday with all of its horror and confusion. Friday with all of its failure. They're going to Galilee with uh, two reports preceding them. They're going with the report of the angel that says Jesus is risen and also with the report of the guard that says the disciples came by night and stole his body. And I ask you tonight, which is most believable? Which is most believable? That he rose from the dead, as the angel said, 
or that the disciples came by night and stole his body, which is most believable, which is the closest to human understanding. Now, if we take the latter, we can support it using Mary's words in John 20 and 13. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. That in Mary's understanding, there was no way that any other explanation for Jesus' absence could be sufficient. And although Jesus had said he would get up after three days, this statement defies human logic. A dead man rising from, from the dead defies human logic. It defies science. And Mary is an example of this. But not only Mary. But they all struggled to understand what all of this meant. And they go to Galilee with doubt and disbelief. Let that sink in for a second. They all go to Galilee, those who had walked with him, those whom he had called, those who had seen him do numerous miracles. Those who had heard him say that he would ra be raised from the dead after three days. They go to meet him in Galilee, the place of their beginning, to begin again, but they go to this place with doubt and disbelief. And in the face of all of that, the Lord Jesus meets them where he said he would. And when he meets his followers and they see him, they all worship him. But some doubt it. And I used to be offended by it, by that verse. Verse 17, some doubt it. And I used to shout at the text that no one has any business doubting the resurrected Lord. They should have believed him, taken him at his word. But then I discovered that the doubt of some didn't change what Jesus was, the risen Lord. I've discovered that it may take some people longer than others to understand that. And that's okay because that's a part of the faith journey. That faith is a journey. It's a journey of which nobody is ever completely on the same page. That everyone is always in different places. And those places vary with time and experience. This has been my own experience. And in the text, Jesus makes no adjustment to this. He accepts them, all of them, where they are. That this does not put a damper on things that some doubted him even while they worship, that he's lived his life with far worse than doubt. I have several questions regarding this verse uh, that I want to uh, lift at the outset um, for discussion on, on Sunday for those of you who are able. And I hope these questions uh, make for a rich discussion. 
Um, have, have we ever been in the place where we worship God while doubting him? This stems from verse 17. Have we ever been in the place where we worship God while doubting him? Secondly, do our doubts make God any less God? Do our doubts make God any less God? This third question, who else in Scripture has struggled trusting God. Who else can you name? I have one more question that I will reserve for the end of this lesson tonight, but I invite you to reflect on this passage after tonight, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, to write them down and to uh, share it with us on Sunday. In the text that we read on tonight, uh, their doubts did not make Jesus any less Lord. For he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That Jesus has officially transitioned to supreme authority. He has transitioned to supreme authority. Friday is, is behind him. He has now been given all power. And this is what I argue on tonight. And I pray that this uh, will be a blessing to all of you. Uh, that his authority is a result of his vindication. And one way to talk about resurrection is to talk about vindication. And to be vindicated is to be proven right. It is to be cleared of blame or suspicion. And in Jesus' case, he was who he said he was the Son of God. He said he was God's Son, and the powers that be said he was not. And they demonstrated that by killing him, by crucifying him. But then God raised him three days later with all power. The resurrection is God's vindication of Jesus. It is God's affirming that Jesus was right about who he said he was. Scripture points to this in several places. Uh, I'd like to lift those places on tonight, three places. Uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. We've been here before. I want to go back here and just read it. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. 
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. If you haven't noted this place yet, do so on tonight and return back to it in your own time. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Colossians 1, which is right next door to Philippians. Colossians 1, 15 through 18, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, you can underline that, that in everything he might be preeminent or supreme. And then this place in Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So when you go back to Matthew, where we are tonight, you see Jesus standing in the authority that the aforementioned places uh, read confirm. And he is able to do that because he is who he said he was. He was right about who he said he was. And God proved that by raising him from the dead. That what we read in Philippians, in Colossians, in Hebrews, Jesus was claiming all of that while he was in the world. And he was unapologetic about his claim that he was God's son. 
and it caused him great difficulty in his life and ministry. That he, that he ran into difficulty living out who he was in the lives of people. That he lived out uh, who he was in the lives of people by giving them resurrection. By giving them liberation. Sight to the blind. Freeing people from demons, making the lame walk, making the deaf hear and the mute speak. All of those are forms of resurrection. All of those are forms of liberation. And as a result, he was met with all kinds of hardship from those who didn't want liberation for everybody. He was met with all kinds of hardship from those who profited off of human suffering, off of human brokenness. How much has that changed? How much has that changed? This is the 21st century. This is a first century story. How much has changed? And in the midst of all of that was Jesus living out who he was as the son of God. And that meant providing liberation uh, in the lives of people who were broken. And this caused them a great deal of suffering. Uh, one form of suffering that was inflicted on Jesus long before Calvary uh, was in... Uh, the powers that be trying to isolate him, trying to confine him to the places of distrust and disapproval. And they did it by calling him out his name, by calling him things that he was not. That in response to his healing one time of a demon possessed person, the religious leader called, called him Beelzebub the prince of demons. In response to his uh, eating and fellowshipping with tax collectors and sinners, the religious leaders called him a glutton and a drunkard. In response to his claims about the kingdom of God and about who he was, as God's son, they said that he was crazy. He out of his mind. And even at his trial, he was falsely accused of stirring up the people. And he was killed in the name of blasphemy, in the name of a lie. That he was innocent, but he died a criminal's death. But then God got him up. That all that was said had lost its power in the face of what God said with the act of resurrection. That God let the powers that be say what they had to say. And then on the third day, God said, And the resurrection is about God's last word on who Jesus, who Jesus is. Not only in his case, and this is great news tonight, that this not only applies to Jesus, but to, to all of us. That God has the last word on who we are as his children. And this ought to free us up to be who God has called us to be. Knowing that God will give us the victory. That we don't have to be anybody else but ourselves. And that will come with some trials. That may come with some discouragement. It will come with some disappointment. It will most likely come with a lot of scrutiny. But in the end, when we are who 
who God has called us to be, God will always honor that. God in his own way will find a way to honor that. That for a few days it looked like Jesus was wrong about who he said he was, but in the end God proved him right by raising him. Some of us have been falsely attacked, viciously smeared by reputable people, as Jesus was, only for God to give real clarity on our behalf. And then there are those of us who have had to live with the lies that have been circulating. And that vindication is that it, whatever has been circulating hasn't been enough to slow them down, nor has it been enough to stop God's blessing or God's anointing. In fact, sometimes the more that people move to crush us, the more God blesses us. And that's a form of vindication. God gracing us to be who we are in spite of. And secondly, not only is Jesus who he said he was, but those that met him in Galilee are who he said they were, his witnesses, his church. And as the church, they are who he said they were, and they have been given his power and presence to be who he said they were. He gives them instructions, go to all people, make disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age, that this will be an all-inclusive mission. And this invitation is indicative of who Jesus was and did. He was a whosoever will person. He had a whosoever will ministry. And in this mission, in this ministry, uh, baptism will be a symbol of belonging to the family of God. And teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded will be key to every disciple's development. And all of it is in, within the framework of what Jesus commanded. And this is what they're being commanded to do, to carry on Jesus' work, knowing who they are in Christ, that he didn't send them out to be discovered. He didn't send them out to make a name for themselves. He sent them out to make disciples. And the work is still the same for us as disciples, that when we operate within the function that we have been given, we'll be productive. And this is what happened to, to the early church. Quickly, this place in Acts, Acts 2 and 37. I'm going to conclude at 41. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, 
every one whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That in these verses are the elements of the instructions given in Matthew 28. The instructions that are followed obediently by Peter and the apostles, which yields a great, a great catch, if you will. 3,000 souls. And this happens because they're operating within the function that Jesus gave them in Matthew. And what is true for them is also true for us as a church today. Uh, lastly, we have his presence. Not only do they have the power to function as Jesus commanded, but they have the promise of his presence all the way to the end. That they will go about their mission, but they will go about it with him being with them. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. That what is most different about this meeting in Galilee is Jesus' presence. His presence. That he will no longer be uh, physically present. But he will yet be present with them. He'll be present more now than he than he ever was. That before his resurrection, he can only go to one place with them at a time. And now he can go everywhere anytime. And he can do this because he will be present with them through the Holy Spirit. And it was his presence with them that moved them from their places of doubt. It was his presence that enabled them to preach and teach his word. It was his presence that enabled them to endure every trial that they faced, for they came to know that as long as he was with them, as long as he was with them, they would be victorious. They knew that the work that they were doing would be proven right because the one who gave them the work had been proven right and would be present with them. And the good news is that God is with us. That as God said to others before us, I will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus says the same thing. Lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. That Jesus is clear about who he is, about who we are, and about his presence with us. And as a result, that ought to lift us to a place uh, where we can freely function as the people he has called us to be. That is my lesson on tonight. I pray that it has be, been a blessing to all of you. And um, I said earlier that I had another question to add to uh, the three that I raised earlier. And this last question involves vindication. And it is this, do you, do you know of any other stories of vindication that have been a blessing to you, either from scripture or from history? 
Do you know of any other stories of vindication? And there are, there are plenty. Uh, but do you know of any that have been a, a blessing to you? And I invite you to make a note of, of that story. And uh, if, you, if you would, be willing to share that with us in our discussion on Sunday. Also, if, if you've looked at this text, I think I said this earlier, and you uh, come up with some questions of your own or comments of your own, write those down and uh, step out on faith and share those as well, uh, that our conversations can, uh, can be meaningful. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for saving us, for affirming us as your children and your church. And Lord, we thank you for being with us. We love you so much. We honor you and we praise you for who you are and for all that you've done. Forgive us of our sins and continue to mold and make us into the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, love you, and shalom. It's offering time, shalom. You may call the office at 314-653-653. 2300. Drop off or mail your check to the church at 5491 North Highway 67, Florissant, Missouri 63034. Through Realm via the church website at www.shalomccop.org. Or you may text FCCOP to 73256. Happy April, Shalom. The sun is shining longer, the ground is starting to thaw, and buds are blooming everywhere. All signs that spring is finally here. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Did you know that 13.4% of the nation's population identifies as Black or African American? And of that 13.4%, more than 16% reported experience some type of mental illness. We are going to address this disproportionate number by offering mental health class on Tuesday, May 3rd and Wednesday, May 4th. Both classes begin at 7 p.m. and will be held at the Lindbergh campus. Class size is limited, so to secure your seat, please register via the church website. In our efforts to continuously give back to our community, we will be implementing the Shalom Adopt-A-Family Initiative. Through this program, we will support students from local elementary and middle schools until they graduate high school. Our goal is to ensure they have everything they need to complete their K-12 academic career. You may offer support by making a donation via the church website under Adopt a Family, or you can reach out to one of the representatives to see how else you may be of assistance. Congratulations to those who will be graduating at any level in 2022. The last two years have been indescribable, but you persevered and we want to celebrate you and your accomplishments. Please submit your name, diploma or degree, name of the educational institution, and a photo to Shalom Church at shalomccop.org or to Eric Morris at e.morris at shalomccop.org. Join us for our weekly Wisdom Wednesday services at 7 p.m. via live stream. Stay connected with us by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or subscribing to our YouTube channel. Let's remember Shalom family. Even during these unprecedented times, we are still committed to Christ's work through preaching, teaching, and praying. Those are your announcements. Stay safe, remember to mask up, and have a blessed week.
Thank you.